Hello. Um, good evening. Thank you for your presence. And uh, thanks also to all, of, to all of you who are following us online. Uh, today we have the pleasure to, um, to have with us Professor Seyla Ben-Habib. She's, um, she's one of the greatest political theorists, I would say, from in, in our times. Uh, she, has been, uh, she has been dealing with quite a lot of subjects related not just to, um, to philosophy or um, political theory itself, but also with um, political science. I think, you, I, I think her, um, her chair is called Political Science and Philosophy, which I guess um, perfectly reflects um, her main objects of, of study. Well, among her works, I would, I would underline some like Critique, Norm, and Utopia, which was one of her earliest works, The Claim of Culture, Another Cosmopolitanism, Equality and Difference, Dignity and Popular Sovereignty in the Mirror of Political Modernity. She participated also in, in, in the book on the democratic disconnect. Of course, um, amongst uh, some of the books that I liked particularly um, were um, The Democratic Disconnect or the Rights of Others. It's a real pleasure to have you with us, Professor Ben Habib, and um, I give you the floor. The floor is yours. Yeah. Thank you very much, Professor Vaispina. Um, can you hear me all right? Yeah, we can hear you yes. perfectly. Yes. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, dear students and colleagues, uh, compañeros y compañeras, it's a real pleasure to be speaking with you this evening. Uh, it's been three years since I was back in uh, Europe, but as I was telling Professor Vaespin uh, before, um, I consider myself a European and I have been following uh, the events of our times in as many foreign languages as I can. <laughs> uh, tonight, I want to undertake uh, what is called in German a Zeitdiagnose, that is a diagnosis or a reflection upon our times. I feel that it is too early for philosophy to paint its gray on green, to use Hegel's famous phrase about philosophical reflection, and to provide a strict comprehensive theoretical analysis of the moment that we are traversing. We may already be at the beginning of World War III, as Slavo Žižek has recently argued. I don't know, I doubt it. Rather, what I would like to do this evening is to analyze the ideological elements of a regime type, which we can call authoritarianism, competitive autocracies, single party state capitalism of the kind that dominates China. It is less these labels in comparative political science that concerns me, but a certain commonality in the deep structure of a worldview that is emerging and that is shared by Trump in the United States, Jair Bolsonaro in Brazil, Recep Tayyip Erdogan in Turkey, Modi in India, Orban in Hungary, as well as Putin. After clarifying what I will call the trifecta of this ideology, I will turn briefly to Adorno and Horkheimer's dialectic of enlightenment in an effort to understand this emerging worldview. By returning to Adorno and Horkheimer, I'm not signaling a shift away from my recent work on Habermasian programs of communicative ethics or discursive democracy. Uh, rather, I think we need to understand the psychological forces and the transformations of our time, which are threatening to uh, undermine these ideals of communicative ethics and deliberative democracy. So let me begin. 
Before the start of what is turning out to be the biggest ground battle on the European continent in the last 80 years, many intellectuals and opinion makers in the West had been predicting the death or the end of democracy. In a much discussed book of the same title, Harvard political scientists Daniel Ziblatt and Stephen Levitsky wrote about the death of democracy, while the British political philosopher David Runciman prophesied the end of democracy. Yet the will of the Ukrainian people to determine their own future for themselves, free of domination, and to be able to join institutions such as NATO and the European Union, ironically shows that despite the sense of gloom and doom that pervades in many intellectual circles in the West, the wish of many people in today's world to live in democracies and to exercise self-determination has not diminished. Accompanying the sense of pessimism about the future of democracy have been the fear as well as the dislocations caused by the worldwide pandemic of the corona, but what we usually refer to as the COVID-19 virus. Suddenly, our world seemed to have shrunk because the virus was everywhere. At the same time, we were all quarantined in our private spaces. Nations pulled up their drawbridges and fortified their borders against guests and friends, refugees, as well as migrants. As media giants such as Google, Facebook, Amazon, Instagram, and Twitter dominated communication and information, the public square was emptied out. Still today, I'm uncertain whether to speak these lines in the past or present tense, since it is very likely that some or another version of this virus will be with us as long as the whole world has not reached a certain level of immunity. The COVID-19 pandemic has also pulled aside the curtain of neoliberal ideology, which had covered enormous class, race, ethnic and gender cleavages still existent in our societies. The dialectic of interdependence and fragmentation, or sometimes referred to as coming together and coming apart, which has been so characteristic of the global condition for decades, has revealed itself once more. The internal fractures and fissures in our societies between rich and poor, intellectual versus manual workers, Anglo-European and American elites versus Black, Hispanic, and other racialized working minorities who have been subject to unimaginably higher infection and mortality rates, at least in the United States. All these fractures and fissions have come to light. One of the most important racial justice movements of our time, the Black Lives Matter or movement in the United States has taken place against the background of these socioeconomic disparities and police brutality. Can we ever recover a sense of common citizenship and belonging after these conditions? Can we ever recover a sense of renewed global solidarity after nation states have seized on the pandemic to further militarize their borders, restrict travel, shut out refugees and asylum seekers? Will vaccine nationalism be the way of the future? Or will the nations of the globe move towards more intelligent forms of solidarity and sharing? Undoubtedly, the corona pandemic has also aided in the consolidation of authoritarianism in Hungary, Poland, Singapore, India, Turkey, and Brazil, 
while enabling the tightening of power in the already existing autocratic regimes of Russia and China. Let us note here an irony regarding the United States. Had it not been for his denial of the pandemic and the incompetent reaction of his administration to the situation that resulted already in January 2021, more than a year ago, in the death of half a million Americans, had it not been for these factors, ex-President Trump may have been re-elected and we may have been living in a very different world, alas. Still, the long-term impact of the pandemic on democracies is here to stay. Vaccine denialism and the refusal to believe that Trump, in fact, lost the elections go hand in hand in many circles in the United States. But in many countries, climate change denialists and anti-authoritarian anarchists found themselves in a strange alliance. Whereas the first group, the climate denialists, such as Brazil's Jair Bolsonaro, deny scientific truth in order to proceed with the techno-industrial rape of nature, and in particular the Amazonas, the second, that is the anarchists, deny the authority that science provides to governments in limiting civil liberties and freedoms. Skepticism towards science and resistance toward public authority have come together. And we are experiencing a form of counter enlightenment in the shape of climate change denialism and vaccine uh, skepticism. Now, common to authoritarian regimes of our times, are three ideological elements. I'm calling these the trifecta of authoritarianism. First, a deep anti-feminism and misogyny, hatred of women, not only towards women, but also towards gay and trans people that are often feminized, presented in the image of them. Sexual authoritarianism and political repression go hand in hand. Second, there is an ignorant hostility toward predictions of climate change and insisting on treating nature and the environment as sheer objects of manipulation, exploitation, and extraction. Third is the hatred of the foreigner the migrant and the asylum seeker as the unwanted other, as the threat to the body politic. These are the constituents of the counter-revolution of our times. Before proceeding to an exploration of these three dimensions, again, uh, sexual authoritarianism, climate change denialism, and the exploitation of nature. Let me focus the exploitation of nature and the hatred of the foreigner and the stranger. Let me say a few more words about the current European war. Certainly the war in the Ukraine has changed some elements in this constellation. Many European countries and the United States are now opening their doors to refugees as well they should. But this raises and has raised morally uncomfortable questions about white Christian privilege and the discrimination against refugees from Middle Eastern and African countries. Why did Poland treat Afghani and Iraqi refugees caught in the Polish-Belarus border with such cruelty and contempt? Have we forgotten that the Polish Peace Party, PIS, has been against the legal right of women to obtain abortions, rights that are defended by the European Union and the Charter of European Fundamental Rights and Freedoms. 
In the United States, and even in Brazil, the battle around abortion rights, which we all thought had been laid to rest at least three decades ago, are raising their ugly heads again. When we come to the hatred of the stranger and the other, why did Ukrainian guards treat black and brown students who had been studying in their country and trans and gay Ukrainians so differently at the border than other refugees and refuse them passage to other countries? It is as if, along with the coronavirus, a virus of sexism, racism is circulating in the world and simply taking different forms in different societies and different cultures at times. The virus is mutating, but not disappearing. I have called my lecture for this evening, Reflections on the Counter-Revolution of Our Times. Reflections on the Revolution in France was Edmund Burke's famous text from 1790 denouncing the French revolutionaries. In 1919, Ernesto Laclau published new reflections on the revolution of our time. As Laclau explains in his preface, it is not Edmund Burke he was thinking of, but rather Harold Lasky's book published in 1943 and called reflections on the revolution of our time. Thinking about the experience of the British Labour government in the immediate post-war period, Lusky recommended that some aspects of state planning uh, for the, uh, could be used by the West, and he insisted that they could be made compatible with a democratic society. Laclau follows Lasky in emphasizing that the social regulation of production is not opposed to individual initiative, and that the binary of the individual versus the social must be deconstructed. This is the message of the first long essay in Laclau's book of this title. He concludes, as a result, the radicality of politics will not result from the emergence of a subject that can embody the universal, but from the expansion and multiplication of fragmentary, partial and limited subjects who enter the collective decision making process. End of quote the expansion and multiplication of fragmentary, partial, and limited subject. The counter-revolution of our times consists in the attempt of the hegemonic classes worldwide to maintain that they alone embody the human universal, or they alone embody the universal representing the human as such. Whereas Laclau writes of the lessons drawn by the left to give up that a single societal group or class can ever embody the universal, the counter-revolution of our times consists in attempts by hegemonic classes to defend the old universals of gender and race and color as well as the continuing exploitation and domination of nature. These ruling classes do not only consist of the old moneyed groups who own the steel, coal, oil, gas, weapons, automotive, and other first generation industrial sectors in capital societies of the West, as well as state capitalist societies such as China and Russia. They've been there for a long time and they continue to be there. 
But these new classes also include the new billionaires of neoliberal capitalism in the financial and banking sectors. They include the media billionaires of the new world symbolized by Amazon's Jeff Bezos, who not only denies his workers the right to unionize, but even monitors the amount of time they take to go to the bathrooms. So every time we order a book from Amazon, and I do that as well as all of you, we have to think about this painfully. Post-Soviet economies resulted in the rise of the so-called oligarchs in Russia, Hungary, as well as the Ukraine. And countries like Turkey and India have created a new bourgeoisie via state protection of the economy in construction and armament from competition in the global marketplace. It is not a new class war that I'm calling attention to or calling for. My point is that as the left in many parts of the world has retreated from the ideal of embodying the universal, the new hegemonic classes have not done so. They strive to keep alive an ideology of masculinity and manhood, which they see to be threatened by the economic and political power of women, as well as sexual freedoms. These groups are proud of the achievements of early scientific technological modernity, which had the goal in René Descartes' famous words of making us maître et possesseur de la nature. The third element in this ideological universe, namely the hatred of the other, is not confined to the West. So in that sense, my lecture is not about the West and the rest. I'm analyzing commonalities in many regimes. Authoritarian populism has recreated its own internal as well as external others. Modi in India has rendered millions of individuals in Kashmir, maybe of Indian, maybe of Bengali origin, it's un unclear. He has rendered millions of individuals stateless by doubting their documents. And Indian courts are now fabricating their own version of the L'affaire de Foulard by denying the girls of the world's largest Muslim population of over 120 million the right to go to school with their heads covered. And Recep Tayyip Erdogan of Turkey, who is never tired of finding ever more internal enemies among the critics of his regime, but above all the Kurdish population, which he renders into an other inside and outside Turkey. Let us not forget also that despite his attempts to play the peacemaker on the world stage now, Erdogan is no friend of the rule of law or civil liberties and protections. He took Turkey out of the so-called Istanbul Convention, that is the Council of Europe Convention on preventing and combating violence against women and domestic violence, signed in Istanbul in 2011 with the argument that such things did not happen in his country. How or why are these elements related? That is to say, repressive authoritarian sexuality, the exploitation of nature and the denial of climate change, and the fear of the stranger and the other. I would like to remind you here of Adorno and Horkheimer's famous discussion of the saga of Odysseus in chapter two of the dialectic of enlightenment. 
completed in 1944 during Adorno and Horkheimer's California exile and published three years later in Amsterdam, the dialectic of enlightenment was reissued in Germany in 1969. In this work, Adorno and Horkheimer maintain that the radical, radical separation of culture from nature and the reduction of nature to a thing to be manipulated alone leads only, not only, to the exploitation and depletion of nature outside us, but also to the repression of inner nature. They write, the worldwide domination of nature turns against the thinking subject himself. Nothing remains of this eternally self-identical, I think, that should accompany all my representations. This is, of course, a reference to the unity of apperception in Kantian philosophy. And here Adorno and Horkheimer continue their critique of Kant, which accompanies them in many, in many works, and they reject the Kantian epistemological subject. In one of the most famous chapters of the dialectic of enlightenment, they use the story of Odysseus to excavate the history of Western, and we must add here male subjectivity. Odysseus is referred to as cunning by Homer, and his cunning, his cleverness, consists in appeasing the dark forces of nature by becoming like them, but then eventually conquering them. Odysseus offers the Cyclops human blood to drink. He sleeps with the temptress Circe or Kirk, and he listens to the sirens. Now, this is one of the most famous uh, paintings by, from the 19th century representing Odysseus and the saga of the sirens. As you will remember, Odysseus has himself tied to the mast of his ship while he fills his man's ears with wax. And as his ship drives by the song of the sirens, which hitherto no men have been able to resist, Odysseus cries out to his crew to untie him. The crew, of course, can hear neither him nor the song of the sirens. Odysseus wins over the forces of nature by subjecting himself to their power and by being tortured by them, but in the end, by using his brains, his intelligence, to escape death and destruction is a picture also of Odysseus and the Cyclops. Hmm. Adorno and Horkheimer, let me go back to the better image. Hmm. Adorno and Horkheimer also see a class dimension in this myth. The male hero, like the capitalist entrepreneur, is a man of courage as well as tricks. He's the one who outsmarts everyone and saves them from the song of the sirens. But it is the crew, the working masses, that represent muscle power, the fuerza, if you wish, that rows the boat out of trouble. In their psychoanalytically inspired account of the myth of Odysseus, Adorno and Horkheimer see the saga of civilization and its discontents, as Freud would later call this process. 
Civilization emerges through a repression of those instincts that drive us back towards nature, the mother's womb or the mother's breast, if you wish. The self emerges as a disciplined, autonomous individual by mastering those desires that call him back toward pleasure. As the wily Odysseus, the cunning Odysseus, who has built his house out of a single piece of wood nose, and you will remember when the suitors come to Penelope to ask for, their, for her hand, she recognizes Odysseus because he has built their marriage bed out of a single piece of wood. But, and as Hegel reminds us here, desire is sublimated by labor and transformed into a durable object. Hegel celebrates the triumph of gust over nature, but he only adds that it is the slave and not the master that will go on to make history by transforming nature. Now, in recalling this famous discussion of the dialectic of enlightenment, I know that I may be raising more questions for you than answering. Do I endorse an orthodox psychoanalytic theory of civilization and its discontents? Haven't there been massive revisions of Freud, be it by Jacques Lacan or Donald Winnicott? sufficient to discredit the psychoanalytic account of the formation of the male ego through a process of sublimation of nature. Maybe. It's not my intention to get involved in these debates here. I simply want to make the argument that Adorno and Horkheimer's analysis still has tremendous power in linking the emergence of the ideal of the controlled cunning male ego to the domination of nature and the subjection of the other. As you will recall, they undertake this analysis in order to show how Western instrumental rationality could turn into its opposite and regressed into myth, mythology. They wanted to analyze the dialectic between ratio and myth, which they saw embedded in the rise of fascist movements in the 20th century. Commenting on Odysseus's many adventures in which Odysseus becomes a part of the forces of nature that are trying to destroy him in order to eventually win over them, they write, if mimesis, a complicated word that is not just imitation, but mimicry, making mimesis work. If mimesis makes itself like the surrounding world, so false projection makes the surrounding world like itself, and end of quote. That is false projection in fascism stamps the other as the enemy. The Jew is the other, the stranger, the one who is human and clever and set out to destroy you, but who is also subhuman, who reduces, who seduces the master races with their cunning, their money, their sexuality. But substitute for the Jews, the gypsy. And the formula remains. Substitute for the Jew, the Islamist, who is set to enter our societies pretending to be the needy stranger, but through his cleverness and so-called propensity to violence causes destruction. What I'm saying is simply that change the subject of the formula that Adorno and Horkheimer give us. False projection makes the surrounding world like itself. 
the structure of the fear of the other as a form of paranoid projection remains. As the great sociologist Sigmund Baumann once expressed it, summarizing this mentalité said, strangers are dangerous. Let me try to sum up my reflections and move towards a conclusion. I see in the trifecta elements of the authoritarian worldviews of our times, and to recall, these are repressive sexuality, the continuing exploitation of nature and disregard of the evidence of climate science, and racist fears of the stranger and the other, that I see in this trifecta of our times a constellation which Adorno and Horkheimer diagnosed to be the case for the early fascist movements of the 20th century. I think that we should not be reluctant to deploy their legacy in understanding the counter-revolution of our times. A certain vision of masculinity, tough, vulgar, bellicose, contemptuous of homosexuality and transsexuality, disrespectful towards women, seeing them either as mothers or prostitutes, is common to Donald Trump, Yair Bolsonaro, and Recep Tayyip Erdogan. Certainly, Modi and Putin as well share some of these beliefs. One of the first things that the Trump, Trump presidency did was to destroy the Environmental Protection Agency and a proof of the continued building of the Keystone Pipeline extending from Canada to the United States and devastating Native American lands in the process. Likewise, Erdogan's dream is to build an artificial canal parallel to the Bosphorus, uniting the Black Sea to the Marmara Sea, which many architects as well as environmentalists have said is megalomaniacal and dangerous to the environment. I've already mentioned Bolsonaro's attitude towards the deforestation of the Amazonas. I've also provided sufficient evidence of the treatment of refugees and ethnic minorities, be it in India, in Europe, in Turkey. And unfortunately, when Trump called Mexican immigrants and asylum seekers, rapists and criminals, many Americans nodded their head in silent agreement. Adorno and Horkheimer do provide us with a key to understanding the authoritarian personality. Do these movements really represent the counter-revolution of our times? What about economic and political factors, you will say? I want to insist that a fuller understanding of the rise of populist, authoritarian, and autocratic regimes, and I'm talking about right-wing populism here, cannot be understood without the political economy of a global neoliberal world which have not, which may not have imploded. In this respect, I want to recall the work of the economic historian and historian of culture, Adam Tooze, called Crash on the 2008 economic crisis. The work of Wendy Brown on what she calls undoing the demos and Shoshana Zubov's analysis of surveillance capitalism. In other words, uh, I do not insist on the single centrality of this more psychoanalytically informed story to explain our times. I think there is a key there, but I also consider it absolutely essential to look at these works in a political economy. My argument has simply been that if the contemporary left, as Laclau 
says, and I agree with him there, is marked by a retreat from the monopoly of the universal. There is no universal class that will lead us to salvation or redemption. The hegemonic forces of our times still, however, want to monopolize this universal and to project a certain image of humanity in the shape of a dominant and domineering ideal of man. Every hegemonic force generates a counter reaction. And using a phrase that you are all too familiar with, we have to say no pasaran. As one who has been in the academy for the last 40 years, I have great hope that younger generations all over the world believe in a world of gender equality and fluidity. They take climate change absolutely seriously, and many see the world as their cosmos. But we know that these energies and beliefs are not translating easily into the structures and organizations of established democracies. There is a great distrust in representative institutions, and indeed there is a democratic disconnect. Certainly in different ways, the Bernie Sanders movement in the United States, at one time Syriza in Greece, and maybe here in your country, and I look forward to hearing more about it. Hmm. Podemos, Suidadanos, other movements, and Les Gilets Jaunes have attempted to bridge that democratic disconnect between the street and the institutions and the energy of the youth and the institutions. I have my own criticism of some of these movements, and we can talk about it. But I believe that the struggle against the authoritarian forces of our times is going to have to come through a reinvigoration of representative democratic institutions via the input of these resistance movements. And let me finish with a happy picture. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Professor Ben Habib. Now um, we're going to take now, some uh, we're going to take some some questions from the public first, and then those that come via um, our online visitors. Thank you um, very much. I. Um, I think that there's an added question that uh, needs to be um, addressed uh, because mm, uh, there's something in common between Spain and uh, Ukraine that people are not speaking about. Uh, they're the two nation states in where, uh, or nations or uh, social entities where anarchism has been dominant in the beginning of the last century and, and the end of the 19th century. Uh, apparently, <coughs> Magno, uh, the militarist uh, anarchist, was a very good friend of Durruti and Escona, the um, Aragon anarchist. It's coincidence that um, in Spain, uh, contrary to other European countries, the popular resistance was, protagonism, or, or was protagonized the resistance against fascism, the same way as the Ukrainian population is doing so. And I think one has to look into democracy, but has to look into democracy in a more critical way. Because <clears throat> there's an element of collectivism as well, and uh, mutualism and solidarity, which might be crucial to understand this. And it's not being analyzed. 
So perhaps we have this discourse, which is the OCDE uh, Western powers discourse of human rights versus authoritarianism of communist or ex-communist or, or Eastern mode of production or uh, China and Russia. But perhaps there's something deeper in social consciousness that needs to be addressed. What do you think about this? Um, I have to say the acoustic was really terrible. I, I could only hear every other word and unless someone repeats your question, sir, or if you want, come up to the front of the stage. Yeah, but I just, no, um, I just can you hear me hear now? I'm sorry. Can yeah, but make it short, now? please. <clears throat> Perhaps if I distance, can you hear me now better? Can you hear me now? No, pero si da igual, si no entiende. Bueno, bien, vale. ¿Me oye el intérprete? Bien. Pues entonces voy a hablar... Ok, I'll try and speak Spanish, so maybe you can listen to the interpreter. Well, I was saying that there are cultural and ideological traditions of both Ukraine and Spain which have not been analyzed to a great extent. Markov, the Ukrainian anarchist, thought that collectivism and anarchism in Spain in the hemisphere was much uh, stronger than that that was possible in Ukraine because there were no authoritarian, autocratic traditions as was the case with the Russia of the Tsars. Markov visited Paris and Barcelona, was a good friend of Urruti and Afkona, who were anarchist, Spanish anarchist leaders, en la resistencia who y led a, the el carácter de la resistencia resistance in Spain Franco y contra la insurrección resistance against eh, Franco fascista and the Nazis la, Nazis and the fascists europeo, dejando que España se quedara through the non-intervention agreement in Europe which left uh, eh, uh, Spain undefended de países europeos. but this Pero, stood for popular. three years contrary to other European fue, uh, countries que el pueblo se insurreccionó y empezó a ocupar armas y, y, y hacerse fuerte. Y entonces, Giral, me la pregunta, por favor. Sí, Giral, the ones eh, concedió las armas took arms al pueblo, que, en Giral, cierto, es tío abuelo mío. Gave y, the arms to, to esto, the people. Eh, eh, se tiene By un paralelismo way, uh, con lo que está ocurriendo uh, relative. en of mine. Uh, Ukraine, and I think the, there is a parallel between this and the current situation eh, of Ukraine, Ukraine because we have been surprised by the strong resistance of the eh, Ukrainian soviético. people against the no no Soviet uh, or, or eh, sí, Russian no pasarán, authoritarianism. authoritarianism. You've said, no pasarán. But this is a slogan from the First World War. Es que el gran líder is, ucraniano y los grandes líderes militaristas anarquistas españoles eran amigos the y fueron Ukrainian y leader of the time en, and the y, anarchist y, y, leaders, the Spanish anarchist leaders of the, París, of the time como en Barcelona, were donde friends. Entonces pienso and que hay que met in Paris hacer una crítica in so I también think de esta visión that we need de la OCDE, criticize this vision of the OECD and the West against the Asian authoritarianism because I think that both really are struggles que si le parece que esto puede ser interesante porque si nos quedamos dentro del convencionalismo de la lucha es this an interesting idea because el autoritarismo this is not only a struggle a war between democracy and authoritarianism because we would be just neglecting some very important aspects of history Um, I think this is a very interesting observation about a tradition concerning which I don't know that much, frankly. Um, I may have been under the mistaken impression that No Pasaran was a slogan 
or it was uh, a phrase from the Spanish Civil War. And it was with that intention that I used it. What you were saying about the Ukrainian anarchist tradition, self-organization is very, very interesting. And, um, uh, you know, you may be right about, you're obviously right about these historical connections, but I think uh, what I'd like to pick up on is your suggestion, because this is more a theoretical suggestion than a historical suggestion. Your suggestion that there is somehow a, a, a third way to think beyond the uh, binarism of authoritarianism versus contemporary liberal democracies. Okay? And that I find very very important and i find that very uh very uh, uh fruitful uh to to think about because um uh it is uh, at least it's very clear very clear to me uh, that uh, um, uh, some of these institutions have been complicit in terms of the building up of armament, in terms of economic interdependence, uh, and they may not be the way the way of the future. Uh, I'm not. I don't think they are. But whether the way of the future will come out of more the anarchist tradition of self-organization. Uh, communal organization, I don't know, but I'm uh, sympathetic. I'm sympathetic and open to thinking, uh, to thinking uh, um, beyond um, some of the, uh, some of the hegemonic, uh, hegemonic ideals of uh, economic, economic liberalism as well. Um, uh, Javier, do, do we have uh, questions from people online. Um, hello, Sheila. I don't know if you prefer me to speak in English, if you understand correctly, or maybe I can uh, speak in Spanish and be translated, whatever you choose. Can yeah, you? Whatever you prefer, okay. whatever is okay. easiest for I, I will, you and I will. for the audience. OK. So um, I will ask a question uh, that is related to another one that was raised by the audience. Um, the, the, the question from the audience uh, was very short, uh, and, and is that when you say anarchist, when you mention the anarchist in the in the um, in your lecture, uh, if you were talking about right wing uh, libertarians of or left wing uh, anarchists, and in connection to this. Um, so I would like to ask a question, and, and that question is that you have proposed to recover uh, the dialectics of enlightenment to explain phenomena, phenomena such as regressive masculinism, masculinism and vaccine denialism. Um, so I am mostly convinced by, by your argument, uh, because one might think that contemporary forms of reactionary subjectivity are characterized by a rejection of all forms of vulnerability or limits, um, whether it comes to dependence or uh, to the others or dependence from nature. However, uh, I think that this reading suffers when we confront it with the fact that vaccine denialism, at least in Spain, has also been present in social sectors that uh, do not seem to reject feminism altogether. There has been social rejection of masks and vaccines by group uh, associated with the hippie culture or other countercultural and anarchist groups, uh, groups that certainly show an anti-authoritarian ideology, but uh, a priori do not seem to be anti-feminist. Uh, so my question is, has this also been the case in the United States, and what is uh, your evaluation of this? Um, thank you. Um, uh, <laughs> one reason why I like to go across the ocean and come to Europe and talk, even if on Zoom, is because of these important political, these important political differences. And um, as an important observation, really, 
I, I saw the question on the chat online about right-wing libertarianism. Yes, I am mainly talking about right-wing libertarianism in the United States that in an ironic way has gone so far as to say, to use the early slogan of the women's movement, our bodies ourselves. And they're using the slogan, our bodies, you know, meaning no vaccine, don't touch me. So I accept that maybe, you know, I, of course, you know, I'm, I am thinking maybe predominantly of the US context and in the European context, the situation is much more mixed. Not only are there, you know, um, anti-cultural hippie vegetarian, the, um, um, uh, there is very strong um, anthroposophic movements in Germany, what's called Naturheilkunde, naturalists, and so on that go that go into this into this um, camp as well. So uh, um, uh, you are right. The anti-wax movement is a very is a very complex is a very complex uh, movement, and I wrote a little bit a couple of years ago also about an essay by Giorgio Agamben, when at the beginning of the pandemic, Agamben basically thought that this was a um, rumor uh, spread by the governments based on faulty scientific evidence in order to perpetrate the state of emergency, okay? And to continue governmental power, as you may know, subsequently, Agamben corrected his uh, position, and uh, there was an interesting exchange even between Agamben and Ranciere on this, on this question. So it is complex. There is a left wing, uh, both a natural, you know, na movements of naturalism, hippie movements that, that criticize this, and uh, yes, and they are not necessarily anti-sexuality and anti-repressive uh, and against against um, uh, feminism. I think I think that actually that's a very helpful and a good observation. And let me add one more thing. Of course, in a lecture, you can only do so much uh, to present the complex story, and the complexity of the story is that. Not all rejections of science-based authority belong in the counter-enlightenment. I think one needs, you know, I couldn't go into this in the lecture very much, but there is a way in which science also can be used as an ideology in order to prevent uh, uh, questioning, in order to prevent the questioning of authority. And um, uh, so I don't want to I don't want to uh, deny that, but we have to we have to draw important distinctions. No, we have to draw distinctions between a kind of a critique of science as it is misused by the authorities to protect their power and not be questioned. And then a critique of science, which basically amounts to a critique and rejection of all the uh, values of rationality. And science has rational values. Science did invent the vaccine. It did invent the vaccine against you know, polio and malaria and against AIDS. I mean, we shouldn't have to repeat to repeat this. And uh, you know the side effects of taking the vaccine are just really ridiculous and minimal. So it, you know we have to we have to be we have to be careful to 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 make to make the proper distinctions here. And unfortunately, within the U.S. discourse, um, because the whole thing became so hopelessly politicized. OK, we lost over one million people in this country because of the stupidity 
of political groups and political organizations. Europe did not do that badly, comparatively speaking. So, um, yes, thank you for your point. It's helpful. Thanks very much. So, um, yeah, there are more questions. So, thank you very much for, for uh, this answer, because I think that the way you developed the different ways of rejecting uh, science is crucial to, to understand the current uh, ideological formations. But let me ask another question that is related to the diagnosis uh, you propose. I hope uh, that uh, uh, I am being understood. Uh, is the... Um, yeah. Yeah, okay. So you have argued uh, that the rise of sexist and racist elements in some of today's political ideologies can be explained as an attempt by the hegemonic classes, by the elites, to defend uh, the old universals of gender, uh, race, and color, uh, as well as, as an attempt to, to continue exploiting nature. And yet, today we also find a critique by both the left and the right that claims the existence of other kind of elites. Uh, under the rubric of neoliberal progressivism, uh, for example, Nancy, Nancy Fraser mentions this idea of neoliberal progressivism. Uh, this critique will seem to imply that there is a political project that seeks to build a capitalism that is more diverse in terms of gender and race, but uh, equally destructive in social and ecological uh, terms. Do you think that this coexistence between authoritarian neoliberalism and progressive neoliberalism testifies a sort of conflict between economic elites? Uh, or do you think that it is incorrect to say that these two ideologies exist, uh, namely authoritarian neoliberalism and progressive neoliberalism? Uh, I, I uh, know my... Um, <laughs> Nancy's work of, uh, of course, my uh, dear colleague. Um, mm, uh, let me let me let me put it this way. Um, I I believe that um, there is more there is more complexity here, and um, I don't think that. Okay, let me start this way by just giving you giving you an example. Um, I have been in the academy, you know, all my life. I entered it, you know, as a graduate student at the age of 21, 22. And um, numbers matter in institutions. As a woman who was very often the only person in Habermas's seminar, as a woman who sometimes was the only person to raise her hand in a discussion group, I want to say against my good friend Nancy, and she knows this, numbers matter. It is not enough, it is not enough, but you need to have the presence of excluded peoples in the institutions. And today, when I look at the struggle that is going on, and again, the United States has its own unique history of white and black chattel slavery. It is not the same in the Spanish, speaking countries, the color line and the class lines are much more mixed up, let's say in countries like uh, um, Salvador, Honduras, etc. I'm aware of that, okay? But uh, one thing I believe is common is that unless people enter institutions and unless they can tell their own narrative and they can talk from their own experience. These institutions will not and do not change. 
So I don't think we should be too clever and go back to an old Marxist trope of criticizing just capitalism and saying, oh, well, yes, Hillary Clinton did not get elected US president. Who cares about the glass ceiling? I don't care about Hillary Clinton's politics as well, not about the glass ceiling, but I am not ready to accept the argument that it does not matter. It matters a lot. Today, for example, there is a new cohort of political philosophers, some of whom had been my students, who learned Hegel and Habermas and Adorno and Horkheimer from me, who are now teaching Du Bois, who are now writing books about Black political thought. And you know something? I really don't know about this stuff. And I have to learn about this stuff. And it matters. It matters that they are there. I'm sorry, you know, if I'm getting passionate about this, because I think it's a wrong argument to say, you know, progressive neoliberal capitalism, you know, creates this ideology of diversity around gender and race, but it goes on to be capitalist. Yes, it does. Okay. But if we are going to change these institutions and introduce these perspectives, we have to march through the institutions. Numbers, numbers matter. So in that sense, whatever you know, struggle we are going to have, and in you know, I like Wendy Brown's term, we need to reconstitute the boundaries of the demos. How are we thinking about this new, this new demos? How can we bring in uh, the diversity of voices and, and experiences. So I would like to think that this is not an either or, that is the struggle for expanding institutions, for expanding diversity, for what I have called the struggle for democratic iterations in public institutions and the struggle against uh, neoliberal, you know, hegemony. For me, these are not mutually mutually exclusive. More questions? I see something in the chat from my old friend and colleague mm -hmm. uh, here. Do you see this in the chat from David Alvarez Garcia? Great. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, you can you can reply. You can reply him. Okay, <laughs> David Alvarez, right? Can everybody read it? The new far right populist movements do not have a coherent and systematized ideology. They are opportunistic, exploiting discontent and mobilizing emotions in social networks. They dominate the fragmented public sphere through memes and twitters. However, our democratic institutions are modeled after the ideal of rational deliberation and scientific method. Are you still optimistic about the possibility of incorporating and disarming these movements through deliberation? Uh, very difficult, very difficult question because I think the fragmentation of the public sphere is one of the uh, biggest weaknesses of contemporary of contemporary democracy. And um, I mean, there was a time when we talked about the pluralization of public spheres, and for example, the critique of hegemony that was voiced by thinkers like Gayatri. Gayatri Spivak um, celebrating alternative public spheres. But what we are dealing with now is not just a pluralization, uh, but uh, competing universes of truth. And that's why we are using the phrase a post truth, a post truth universe. Um, and uh, the way the way in which you know these um, uh, these um, universes can be so can be so opposed uh, opposed uh, to uh, to one another. 
but um, I do believe in the power, for example, of good and honest journalism. Uh, it's still it's still very very important, and um, lies you know can go very far. They can go very far, and they can they can drive people crazy. But uh, uh, but we still have to we still have to fight against uh, lies with the value of truth. Otherwise, where are we? I mean, nothing nothing. Nothing matters if we if we cannot fight, if we cannot fight um, lies uh, uh, with truth. But it is an enormous uh, challenge, uh, David, that you are raising because what has also what is also happening is the mode of communication is changing. I mean, uh, when um, President Trump was probably the first tweeting president in history. I don't know if, you know, if there was a president on Twitter before him. I don't think so. The technology was not, was not there. But what something like this does is it has the effect, you know, the same way that the radio in the Second World War, like Hitler used both radio and film to mobilize the masses. Twitter is also an immediate instrument of mobilization and reaction that does not leave room for a discourse and deliberation and argumentation like we are having here. And, um, and we, have to, uh, we have to try to recover those public spaces of discourse to the best of our ability, those public spaces of argumentation. And I uh, think that, um, uh, you know, there is no, there is no, there is no other way of uh, doing it. I know that some, some colleagues say, so why aren't you on Twitter? Why don't you do, I don't believe in talking like that. I don't believe in communicating like that. And many of you may be on Twitter, it's fine. If you're just chatting with your students and you know whatever your friends i know my daughter uses it but <laughs> i cannot do political philosophy on twitter and i will not do that and uh you know without this exchange without this give and take um we cannot think together we cannot think together so i think that we just need to we just need to put these uh new technologies they are here to stay uh but uh, <laughs> we just need to to try to to try to somehow cordon them cordon them off and control their their influence by the best possible also you know uh public uh, public support also you know for for journalism and news media you know i really i really believe uh, believe uh in uh in in uh, such uh such public uh, uh support and and uh funding as there is a nice slogan uh i don't know who is it from in, is it from the new york times or whatever it said democracy dies in darkness mm -hmm. i think that's true yeah, I think it's from the Washington Post. <clears throat> Is it from the Washington Post? I think, okay. I think, I don't know. I don't know maybe, maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> I, 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 I do have a question, which, uh, because um, I think you, uh, what you mentioned regarding this, um, this contradiction between um, uh, Eastern European countries um, creating a war in order to avoid Syrians, you know, the summer of 2015, getting into into the borders, right? And recently, you know, what happened with those Afghans who weren't allowed, you know, to enter, to enter Poland through Belarus. And at the same time, if we, if we compare, you know, what's happened right now, there are already two and a half million migrants from, from the Ukraine in Poland and, um, you know, up to, well, the rest have been 
perfectly integrated in, in, in other countries, you know, that lie on the border of, of that country, right? <clears throat> so um, my question would be, um, do you think uh, this is simply a question of racism? Uh, has this to do with, uh, with this communitarian perspective, you know, that, you know, we, we, we can only be really um, solidary with those that belong to, that belong to us somehow? Um, does it have to do with the fact that we can project the, ourselves, you know, on, on them, in the sense that we, we share the same enemy and, and therefore, you know, what they're experiencing is something that we fear that might happen to us? What may be the reason? Because it's stunning, really, you know, the, the difference is absolutely, absolutely amazing, right? But I don't have... A, I don't have an answer for that, really. So, uh, um, how do you evaluate it? <laughs> Thank you for that for that question. Um, I um, had to think about this in the context of a course I'm teaching at Columbia Law School now, hmm. uh, called Citizenship, Refugee, and Migration Law in Comparative Perspective. And let me just say something. Um, one of my books that was translated very early into Spanish is Los Derechos de los Otros, yeah. you know. Mm -hmm. um, and I have been working on the refugee question uh, in terms of, you know, both international law and culture. Um, what happened in Poland? at that time uh, is has uh, levels, right? First, there was the claim these Iraqi and Afghani people were lied to by the Belarus government. And I think that's true. Mm. Uh, a lot of people paid the little money that they had, five, seven, eight thousand dollars and uh, they traveled, they first had to go to Abu Dhabi, and then they were brought to Belarus, etc. If you've read their stories, mm -hmm. they, they were lied to, there's no question about the fact that they were lied to. But once they were at that border, I think the obligation of the Polish government, as a member of the European Union, as a member of the European Convention, was simply to grant these individuals an asylum interview. And they just had to, according to international law, they should have tested these claims. It may have turned out that some of these claims were genuine and some not. Now, there is the whole problem of what kinds of documents that these people have with them. How could they really document that they were being persecuted according to the according to the Geneva 1951 Refugee Convention? But uh, what really I think was wrong, and this was part of the um, uh, whole right wing ideology of the peace government, is to deny these people any any rights at all. And uh, you will remember there were many people in um, people, in, many people in Poland itself living close to the border that started putting lights out and that started putting food out. Uh, so Polish civil society right now itself is very divided. And I think that you probably in Europe, you're, you know it you know, better than I do that. So, uh, um, um, I, I believe this is still very disgraceful. And it has to be said that it was disgraceful. No, they did not have to accept everybody. And the numbers weren't that great. But they had some obligations under international law that they could have lived by. Now, the question of sympathy and solidarity 
and saying uh, these are people just like us uh, coming uh, from the Ukraine and so on. I can understand that. And I don't want to say this is just like racist. No, there are there are natural human uh, uh, human sympathies, but they have to be they have to be measured and contained by you know other obligations of international law. Look, let me give you an example. Turkey right now has three point seven million Syrians, okay? yeah. and somehow. Um, you know, I mean, Turkey has its own complex interpretation of the 51 Geneva Convention. It does not accept as refugees people, convention refugees, except those who are coming out of Europe, which is an odd form of, you know, Turkish racism. But it has its own, its own uh, convention. No question about the fact that, you know, people in Turkey, you know, they are grumbling, but they're not you know, screaming and making a fuss because Syrians are like that. And they are Muslim, although they don't like the kind of Islam that Syrians represent, etc. Um, uh, I, I, I don't think I don't think that we should be um, we should completely close our, our eyes uh, to this. But we if you know, in a democracy, what we have to do is we have to we have to learn to mediate natural sympathies and affections with the rights of others, right? What do we owe each other as human beings? What do we owe each other, right? There is that, and there is also natural bonds of solidarity that we may, we may feel. So I think that I want to distinguish my position, you know, from a kind of bland uh, universalism. You know, one of my early essays has been the generalized and the concrete other. Oh, sure. <laughs> and and my, my goal has always been trying to think, uh, uh, to think beyond the dichotomy, beyond the dichotomy of human rights versus solidarity for those who are, who are like us. Is there is there a way to reconcile and to bring uh, to bring those you know to bring these elements uh, these elements together? And I think that um, I mean in this respect, I think for example, Spain has done very well by giving you know amnesty and citizenship to if I'm not making to close to seven hundred thousand Moroccan migrants and workers, your culture is much more enriched. Um, and maybe, you know, countries with longer historical memories of diversity of empire have have this have this capacity, have this capacity for uh, for um, uh, absorption. But um, what happened with those Indian students and African students at the border uh, was just too much in Ukraine. It was just, it was, it was horrible, right? Uh, these are people who are studying in the Ukraine. They were studying medicine there because they wanted to be, okay. So as long as the point was made, as long as the government corrected its mistakes, as long as there was an apology, was there an apology? I don't know if there was an apology. I think eventually these students, these foreign students managed to go to their own countries. But what about the gay and trans Ukrainian people? What about them? I think they are still in their country. Many of them turned back. Uh, they had nowhere, nowhere else to go. Uh, uh, you know, you may say, it, is this really an important issue to raise in the midst of a war? Uh, aren't you being a little what? Uh, you know, um, too much identity politics. And I'm not, uh, you know, an identitarian. But there is always the question of rights. And as Rosa <laughs> Luxemburg and I said, you know, freedom is always the freedom of the one who thinks differently. So. 
I'm very careful. I'm, you know, I'm very careful about about these about these things, particularly in the context of the fact that war always brings forth a certain form of machismo. But um, there are also many women fighting in Ukraine, which is quite admirable. So I hope my my thinking on this it's you know has has helped a little bit uh, it has helped <laughs> your whole lecture today um so we've run out of time I, I want to thank you again professor ben habib for for your presence here and um thanks a lot i want also to thank the audience here who are present and of course the ones who are um, still online thank you very much indeed for for everything.